Hi, and welcome to the Signal Path. In this episode, we're going to do another repair. But before we get to this, I really need your help with something. So those of you who know me and know the channel, know that I make these videos to give back to the community. I want to make sure this type of knowledge is available for everybody for free. As a result, I don't really care so much about subscriptions and so on. You can see my subscription count over here is just under 64,000. But unfortunately, when I engage with some vendors, their marketing teams do care about subscription and they often have a threshold of about 100,000 for the channel to be large enough to warrant serious engagement. Now, I want to continue to make these videos and I'm interested in being able to do some of the things these vendors have to offer and I show them on camera. But I need to hit about 100,000 subscribers. Now, statistically, I could do this by making different kinds of videos, the videos that appeal to a different audience. If you look over here, my most popular videos are what I would consider general electronics, the simpler videos, more introductory topics like class AB amplifiers and how to wire up LEDs with Arduino, how to make single transistor amplifiers. These are interesting and have value, but these are not the things that are unique about this channel. I bring you know, measurements up to 110 gigahertz, complex RF, microwave, digital and optical concepts, and these are not easily and readily available on YouTube. That's what I think makes this channel more special. So I don't want to gear it towards having simpler videos, uh, even though they are very useful, but I think there are a lot of people who can do these videos. And even though I would get more subscribers, I don't think that's worth it. But at the same time, when I look at the statistics and I see that about half the people who watch the videos aren't actually subscribed. So even if we just fix that, we can easily hit 100,000. So that's what I need your help to see if we can have ideas and, and ways of hitting that number so I can engage with more vendors and do even more interesting things here on the channel. And of course, Patreon plays a huge role and I can't thank you guys enough. Uh, the video that I'm going to do today is all, again, thanks to the Patreon support. This is the reason why it is possible. Otherwise, it'd be, it would just not be feasible to purchase this equipment at the cost. I often have to spend quite a bit more than the Patreon support anyway, but at least it makes it possible and, and, and practical to actually make it. But anyway, I just wanted to let you know, hopefully we can hit that 100,000 number, but let's get back to the video. So let's take a look and see what we have here. So this is obviously an Agilent Infinium DCA. This is the 86100A series. It's a fairly old instrument. It runs Windows 98 and it has some issues we have to take a look at and fix, of course, if we can. Uh, but having said that, this is a wide band oscilloscope. And you may ask, well, why, what is a wide band oscilloscope anyway? Because traditionally, when you hear a wide band with oscilloscope, you just think of a regular oscilloscope. But that's not how these instruments work. Also, importantly, as you can see, I have no modules in here. Without the modules, this thing does absolutely nothing. Unfortunately, the modules are really pricey, and I wanted to make sure that we can get this up and running before I go ahead and invest trying to get some of these, because even when they're broken, they're quite pricey. And they can, of course, when they're new, you can buy modules that are over $100,000. So what is so special about this wide band with oscilloscope anyway? And sh why should we care about it? Well, every oscilloscope that I have shown so far on my website, they're all sampling real-time oscilloscopes, meaning that they have to meet Nyquist criteria of at least uh, have twice the sampling rate as the bandwidth they want to process. So when I did a teardown and review of the 110 gigahertz scope from Keysight, they had 256 gigasample per second. That's the world record, meaning that you can look at 110 gigahertz worth of spectrum in a completely arbitrary way. You have no restrictions on how the waveform should be. It doesn't need to be periodic. It can be in any form as you want, and it will sample it at 256 gigasample per second. But that oscilloscope is $1.3 million, and of course, it's very expensive. And as a result, it's not practical for all applications. Now, it's just now that you see these ultra high bandwidth oscilloscopes actually having anything more than 8 bits of resolution anyway, even though the key side scope has 10 bits of resolution. But if you want to have much higher resolution and you don't want to sample at Nyquist, you can do what's called subsampling. So in a traditional oscilloscope, you can see that this is your waveform and you know you create sampling points here, 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 and here. As long as you meet Nyquist criteria, you can reconstruct your waveform. That's very classic. But in the wide bandwidth oscilloscopes, things are different. Instead of sampling at Nyquist criteria, you sample at much, much lower. In fact, these kind of oscilloscopes that I'm going to show you typically only sample into tens of kilosample per second. But they have much higher vertical resolution. They can go up to 16 bits, 12 bits, even more sometimes depending on the manufacturing process used. This means that if I want to look at a 100 gigasample per second, uh, 100 gigabit per second signal, I don't need to sample it at 100 or 200 gigasample per second. I can sample it at 10 kilohertz if I can wait long enough to reconstruct the waveform because it's periodic. 
which means that if I force periodicity on the signal, like the signal that's down here, I can make one sample over here, and then I can wait for a very long time. Then I make another sample over here, then I wait for a very long time, and do this again and again and again. And then I can just superimpose all of those and reconstruct my waveform. Now I'm reconstructing not the waveform in real time, but the acquisition of the waveform over time. This is a subsampling oscilloscope. And the advantage here is that you can have very high vertical resolution. You can capture this point with very high precision, but you cannot capture them at the same time. So if you have some glitches in the waveform, or even thousands of glitches in the waveform, you may completely miss them because you may never hit the point that you want to measure. But if you wait long enough, eventually, statistically, you will. Now, the only other thing you need to do about this, which is the hardest part, is that you need to have very precise timing, which means that if I sample this point here, and when I sample the next one, I need to create a delta time. This is a sequential delay written here. This sequential delay has to be extremely precise, down to tens of femtosecond. And that's where the trick is. So what they do is that they subsample the waveform, but they subsample it with very high precision, both in vertical and in horizontal time. And then you can reconstruct your waveform. So there's a fundamental difference between these two types of scopes, and they are used in different ways, and they have advantages and disadvantages compared to each other. But certainly cost is one of them. If you think about this, the only component in this entire system that needs to have 100 gigahertz of bandwidth, for example, is the front-end sampling module. Once you do a sample, then everything else is at low frequency, and everything else is just low frequency analog processing, and then a you know, high-resolution digital ADC afterwards. But compared to this, whereas everything has to run at high rate, the memory, the sample and hold, the data converter, everything needs to run at Nyquist. So of course, this is much more difficult to do, whereas this is quite a bit easier. So you can construct an eye diagram in similar way. You can cap, you know, have one dot here, and then do one sample here, do one sample here, do one sample here, and then reconstruct your eye diagram. But the nice thing is that because the timing of these samples are very precise, if your eye diagram has jitter or it has ISI, you can capture that and show it. Therefore, you can do complete analysis of the eye diagram. And then you can throw some fancy DSP at it and even capture the bits as long as everything is periodic. So you need a trigger signal that is coherently locked to the signal you're looking at, and the signal you're looking at has to be periodic at some level in order to be able to do this de deconstruction. So you can find this information and read more about it if you want, but the fundamental principle really is what I described. The difference between sampling in real time, making sure you capture everything the first time you sample it, or slowly sampling, building the waveform over time, but sampling very precisely. And this is what we're going to look at. So this is the reason why I was interested in grabbing one of these and see if we can repair it and get it up and running. And hopefully we can do some experiments with it so you can see it in action. So as I said, this thing is supposed to run Windows. And um, I went ahead and I did a couple of little poking around in it to see what, what is going on. The repairs that I did so far are pretty simple. So I'm just going to go ahead and take it apart and show you what's inside and what I did to it, and then see how it powers on and how it behaves. And here is what is inside the unit looking from the top. And as to be expected, it has a dedicated motherboard that runs Windows 98. This is a fairly old motherboard and it uses a combination of ISA and PCI cards in order to get Ethernet, GPIB, video cards and ID interfaces for the floppy as well as the hard drive. Now this particular motherboard is somewhat custom made for Keysight's Ragellan's uh, uses back then. You can see that there's a lot of wires running around. All the interfaces used to be parallel. It is ribbon cables and they run very fast. So it could go fairly long distances. Now everything is uh, SATA and PCI Express and serial so everything is uh, totally different so you know we wouldn't build things this way anymore but the the way this motherboard interfaces to the other board which is underneath it the acquisition board is through this cable over here which goes into this distribution board over here and this distri distribution box connects with the modules you can insert into the unit from the front two modules at a time and then the whole thing is connected to each other like that and there's a couple of coax cables coming from those and these coax cables are carrying the signal the signal of interest after it's been sampled as i described through the operation of the unit and they go through over here through the acquisition mode underneath and then the other two for triggering go into a mechanical switch here so they use an electromechanical rf relay to switch the trigger between the left module, right module, and front panel. This is in the absence of a, a, a precision time base, which then obviously recreates its trigger internally. But having said that, they use this because they want to maintain a signal integrity of the trigger without doing any processing on it uh, through any solid state devices directly into the acquisition board, just using a mechanical switch. So that's really the only thing that is there. 
Now, a couple of things I had to repair on this, they weren't that exciting really for recording. The fan was bad, the th processor was going through a thermal runaway, so I had to change the bearing on that, change a couple of capacitors on the power supply of this module itself. This thing is the, the, the switching supply uh, converter for the processor over here, so I repaired that a little bit. Again, it wasn't really that interesting. The other thing that I did, which definitely needs to be done, is to change the hard drive. This is a 3.5 gigabyte hard drive. This is a really magnetic one, so nothing unusual. 4200 RPM is pretty slow, but uh, these things are going to die. Just remember, this has been running probably for I don't know how many thousands of hours since this was originally built. So I just imaged this, and I replaced it with another IDE hard drive, which is unfortunately right under this bar right now, but this is a solid-state hard drive with an IDE interface, so kind of backwards compatible with the IDE interface that they used to have, and this is the cable that goes to it. But this will now outlast the rest of the instrument because it's a solid state device and it's imaged and it's not going to die anytime soon. But then this, of course, means that this is kind of useless. And since once you have the image, you don't need this anymore. And I dropped it anyway. So this is dead. Uh, so having said that now, I just copied it, imaged it, and it's identical, runs Windows. The, this instrument hides the operating system fairly well from the user. It just boots into the, uh, the GUI for the unit itself, but it, the Windows 98 ru does run in the background. So having said that, what else do I want to say here? There's a couple of fans here. The, the, the thermal profile of this thing is pretty relaxed because it's fairly wide open, so you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. And um, I made a couple of other m minor modifications, but really nothing unusual, some cable management, cleaning some things, getting the dust out. And I do want to see if I can get USB on this because it doesn't have one. And I did buy something from eBay, or I should say from Amazon, actually, to try and put in there. I'll show you that. But let's first flip it to the other side. Look at the acquisition board, at least one side of the acquisition board, and see what that looks like before we turn it on and do some other experiments. And here's the other side of the board. Nothing exciting, really. All you see the back of the acquisition board is a trigger signal from the front, which goes to the electromechanical relay. I described backlight of the LCDs present. This would be a good candidate for replacing the backlight with LEDs if the screen is dark once we turn it on and see if that's worthwhile doing. And then uh, there, there's, a, there's a timing module underneath a can here, which you can adjust to get the timing exactly like you want. And it's interesting because when you close this up, there's a hole in the bottom of the chassis, which you can pop open, and then you can directly access this without taking the panel off. So it's obviously something as part of maintenance of the unit. We might do that depending on how off this unit is. I'm sure it hasn't been calibrated in 20 years or so. So it looks good. Otherwise, there's a power supply at the back. I think we should try and see if we can get the USB working on it and turn it on and see if it boots into the operating system. I already, like I said, updated everything as, as well as I could. If we can get USB working on this, it would be great because right now the only way to get files on and off of it is either through network or through floppy. But a USB would be very helpful. It would also give us mouse and keyboard. So let's try that. So I want to go ahead and see if I can install this USB card. This is a very basic PCI card. And uh, as you can see, it's a single NEC chipset on it. And it gives us uh, four USB ports, one inside and four on the outside. Now, the issue is that the only PCI card slot that's empty is right over there. And I believe that is shared in some way with the ISA card that's right next to it, which currently has a GPIB controller on it. So we're going to have to remove something in order to fit something else in there. And then uh, hopefully there won't be any conflict. Uh, but I think we can get into the BIOS and try and see if we can resolve those conflicts. So let's change it out and see if it works. So here's the Ethernet card that's in the unit. Man, this is old, from 1997. And here's the ISA GPIB controller, or HPIB controller, made by HP. You can see the card has to be very large, even though it has very little on it because of the ISA interface uh, primarily. But looks nice. All right, let's turn it on, and fingers crossed. Wow, that hard drive, uh, or that floppy drive is really loud. OK, let's see. All right, it's going to boot. And we have booted, and look. We have mouse and keyboard, USB mouse and keyboard. So the USB port appears to be working, which is fantastic. I haven't tried to put any USB drives in it, but I suppose that should work as well. It already detected everything. It took a while to install the drivers, but I think it's good. So now we have everything and the instrument is booted up. Now, of course, it says that there are no modules present in the bottom left here. And that's true because there is nothing in there. So we cannot measure anything yet. And I can't really test anything until I have that. But I did get my module. Let's go and take a look at it. I'm really excited about it. And check out what I got here. This is an HP 5475-1A. This is a dual 20 gigahertz module. You can see one over here, one over here, with a dedicated trigger. Unfortunately, as you can see, it doesn't have the connectors, but you can kind of see the SMAs or the uh, cables in there. This uh, probably not SMAs. They have to be uh, at least uh, three and a half millimeter. Yeah, they are. You can see it's written in there. Otherwise, it wouldn't be supported up to 20 gigahertz. So unfortunately, this is a big risk to buy this because why would anybody remove these connectors? 
if this was a working module, but we're going to try it anyway. And I can do this thanks to my Patreon supporters bringing you these kind of instruments. It's because of what they're doing for the website. I really appreciate it. Please check out the Patreon page as well if you like to continue seeing these kind of videos. So having said that, I, I'm not a patient man, so I went ahead and I bought something else. I picked up this guy over here. This is something. Ah, uh, let me see. There it is. This is an HB 52121A. Now uh, this is actually a four-channel test set for TDR testing, and this has its own trigger generator and so on. And uh, well, you can buy these on on eBay. But this one doesn't have any of its internals. They were all, I guess, stripped away. So I could buy this for less than a hundred dollars. But check it out. It has quite a few of these uh, connectors. These connectors are really expensive. So to get five of them from something that's less than $100 is a big score. So we can definitely take these and connect them to there instead. And it will still be left with two extra ones for other projects. So we have two things to take apart now and uh, merge together. And hopefully we can get this guy working because this guy definitely is not going to do anything anymore. So let's take a look and see what we have here. I'm going to go ahead and remove that. Oh, these are tough to remove. Uh, there we go. Ah, look at that. That's good. I see that the sampling modules are indeed all there. There's the three of them. So that's that's pretty pretty good. That's promising. And I can see even the cables are there, which is one of the things I was worried about because these cables are, are bent specifically for these dimensions. So that cable is indeed there. And if I look to the other side, I can see the other cable there as well and the last cable there. So they're all there, which raises the question of why this was uh, butchered like this. Maybe somebody really needed those uh, connectors in the front for something else and they just took it and reused it. Hopefully this is still working. And these things that the input of these devices can be easily killed. So we're going to have to hope that these sampling modules in the front are working. You can see the distribution of the samplers to the two modules in the front for the two channels. So indeed it looks uh, quite nice. Uh, I think in order to really put this back together, I'm going to have to remove this board to give us some space so we can properly tie these things down. This cable is really loose. Oh yes, that's the trigger cable. This doesn't have a high frequency content as much as the 20 gigahertz ones does. So uh, this one just goes, I believe, directly to the back, all the way to the back, which goes inside the instrument. Looking good so far. So let's open up the other box and see uh, how good those connectors are. Okay, let's see what we have here as well. Take the connector off and oh, this is a pretty sad sight. Someone has taken everything outside of this unit. Most likely they have taken uh, all the modules out in order to repair another one and get another one working. But if I look over here, I can see all of our connectors are there and they look like they're in good shape. And all I just have to do is uh, remove them from the chassis and we're going to have some really nice connectors to put into our other module. And even if that other module doesn't work, this, I believe, is still a pretty good purchase because the connectors are pretty expensive. Uh, let's see if we can remove this last piece here. Uh, I don't like doing this on camera, but I'm going to try it anyway. I can see the power supply board is there. Wow, this thing is uh, quite a lot of stuff in there still. Yeah, so I guess I didn't need this part. I'm curious what's under the, the shield, probably some timing or something sensitive. Let's see what's there. So then I'm not going to really use any of these. Uh, they're not useful for what we want to do. By the way, be very careful when you remove these things because they are really, really sharp. Oh, that's fascinating. I wonder what that is. This might be a... Uh, oh, look at that. I think this is a Varactor. Yeah, indeed it is. Uh, it looks very similar to uh, what is in the oscilloscope too. So I bet there's some common circuitry between this and that. So that's that board is certainly worth saving. It does have some useful cables anyway, so we're not going to touch this for now. We're interested in getting these connectors out. So I'm going to go ahead and take all that out. It's really boring. No point uh, for you guys to watch me do it. So before I move on, I took the connectors out, but there was something here I wanted to show you is worth mentioning. So in this particular board, this is a TDR module, so it's supposed to generate trigger signals and so on in a similar way. And its operation is a little bit similar to uh, frequency counters as well. I had a video going in details of how frequency counter and step recovery diodes work in order to measure very high frequencies and if you're just looking for the frequency. So here's an oscillator section here and this is a tuning for it uh, or it could just be an amplifier but either way there's an oscillation and amplification section over here. And on the other side we have this exposed PCB area and if you look at it closely you can see that there is a little pin on it and this pin uh, there's, a, there's a piece of uh, aluminum here that sits directly on top of that. And, and that's a weird structure. But in reality, that's because there's another module that looks like this. This is from a different instrument that I've opened a long time ago. And this is actually a coaxial input, a very high frequency coaxial input, high, custom made for these. And this guy goes through this piece over here. And then when you flip this over, this can make contact directly to that pin. And that's how you pass the 
high frequency signals, so they're creating a kind of a makeshift coaxial interface that goes through the board and can pass very high frequency without using any cables or anything like that. It's like a board to board or board to module interface, highly customized, and not something that you would normally use these days. But I thought it would be interesting to show you how that's done with the little oscillator section over here. Yeah. It's pretty cool. All right, there we have it. Not too bad. I put the connectors back there. You can see from the face, it looks good. So I'm going to put it back in the unit because I, let's see if it gets detected and then if you have any reasonable signal coming out of it. And then we have to figure out what to measure if this works. And I have a couple of ideas. So I went ahead and put the module in there. It's not giving me any particular warnings and I see both the channels here enabled and I can change the numbers. And of course, there's nothing there because it's not being triggered. I can change the trigger to free running and I can see the two channels. Now there is a bit of an offset on them, which is uh, unfortunate. It seems like there is a five millivolt offset on channel two, I believe. And uh, yeah, that's going to be there. There's nothing I can do about that. And I don't believe that's actually something that I've dialed in. Now you can see the offset is set to exactly zero on both of these guys. And uh, yeah, doesn't seem like there is any setting. There's a 20 gigahertz or a 12.4 gigahertz option. So we can you know, run it at 20 gigahertz and doesn't seem to ma matter so much. I can do the same thing with this one. We're at 20 gigahertz. Nope, I don't see any offsets. Of course, the noise is going to get worse at 20 gigahertz. There's more integrated noise that's going to be present at such a high bandwidth. But yeah, it looks okay. But of course, we won't know until we put a signal in there and see the, if there's a way to get rid of these residual signals. But nonetheless, it's up and running. Now we have to figure out how to test it. I ran the calibration and now the offset is gone, which is fantastic. Now to test to see if the instrument is doing the triggering properly and is preserving a good jitter of the system, we can apply the same signal to the trigger input and to the channel at the same time. That means that I have a power splitter here. This is going to split the power uh, equally between these two ports and I'm feeding that directly from an Agilent EXG, which means that there is going to be correlation between the jitter of the trigger and the jitter of the channel. And that will then only allow the remaining residual jitter of the instrument to remain. So we can apply a signal and see what kind of measurement we get. So the instrument right now is in free run. And of course, if I turn the signal on, you're just going to see nothing because there is no correlation between the triggering and the signal of interest. But I can go ahead under the trigger menu and change that from uh, free running to left module. And I have a signal of two gigahertz, which means that it supports between DC to two and a half gigahertz. So that is supported by this. And now we can go back and we should see a sinusoid. And check it out. It's a beautiful sinusoid. Oh, this, uh, this thing doesn't work very well. Sometimes you run it a few times and it gets better. There we go. OK, it's better. Look at that. That looks good. I think that's a pretty nice looking sinusoid. You can see it's very, very sharp. Uh, I had all these. Uh, all these signal, all these uh, buttons don't work very well. They must be all oxidized. I'm going to have to run them for a while before they go away. Let's go ahead and uh, turn this channel off so it's not on the screen. And we can go ahead and do a jitter measurement and see what is the residual jitter of the instrument. So here's a zoomed in view of this particular waveform. So I'm going to go into eye mask mode so we can allow the signal to basically build up slowly. And then we can go ahead and measure the jitter on this. Now, actually, I'm going to measure from here. Unfortunately, this one does not have the full jitter capability as well as the pattern lock. I don't believe it, it, this particular model supports it, which is unfortunate. But uh, nonetheless, we can go ahead and measure the jitter RMS. And check it out. The RMS jitter is about 1 picosecond. And that is the specification of the unit. It can actually be as high as 1.5 picosecond. Now, the modern versions of this with the precision time base can have jitters that are less than 100 femtosecond. So 10 times at least better than this one, which of course you need if you want to measure 100, 200, 300 gigabit per second signals. You can't actually do that very well with the one picosecond inherent jitter. Because one picosecond inherent jitter from a 100 gigabit per second signal, that's 10% of your eye from the instrument itself. So you can't really characterize anything like that. But nonetheless, this works. As you can see, it, everything is looking nice. Now, this is just a sinusoid, not very exciting. And I wanted to measure something else. So I have something to show you. Let's go ahead and try it. So in theory, we could use the Agilent N4901B to generate a pattern and analyze it with the 86100A. But I've already shown you this and I've done a full repair and teardown of this so you know what's going on. So I picked up something else for this video that we can talk about. And is this guy. This is a four channel 10 gigabit per second uh, pattern generator and error detector. I'm going to analyze it a little bit and figure out how I got it to work. And we can take a look at the eye diagrams directly on our scope. 
And this is the Optalent OPB04X10, a 4-channel 10 gigabit per second instrument. I believe it works from about 9.5 to 11 gigabit per second. Now, it's not really fair to call this thing a BERT. It's not a bit error rate tester. It cannot do jitter tolerance. It cannot do eye monitoring. All it does is generate patterns and record the patterns back and make sure that they match from what it sent. It can only generate uh, two different PRBS sequences. It can do user-generated patterns too. So it's okay for its cost, I guess. It can be pretty useful to have four channels at 10 gigabit per second. So you could mux them and in theory generate 40 gigabit per second NRZ signals or PAM4 signals and so on. So it's, it's fairly useful. And it is based on off-the-shelf components. You can see it's just uh, very simply put together. Uh, I can, I'm gonna zoom in and show you a little bit of uh, some of the properties it has. Now, when I got this, it did not come with the software, and it does not come with, it comes with very little documentation, actually. And it has an RJ45 interface, which is an RS-232 interface, but it uses the RJ45 connector. So I had to kind of reverse engineer and find out which pins are TXs and RXs. And luckily, that wasn't too difficult, because they use a module over here that is just a, basically a microprocessor to control everything. And this is available as a module you can buy, and it has these two pins up here as a serial in, serial out interface. You just have to trace that to which pins there are, and then you basically find out uh, what you need to do. And what I did is I made a little cable, a patch cable, in order to communicate using, where's my patch cable? Here's my patch cable. There you go. I just made this little cable like that between one of these guys and one of these guys, which then goes into a USB port. So this whole mess of cables here is nothing more than a USB to RS-232 converter, which I'm using to talk to this. And then I can ask the, I actually asked the vendor for the software and they were kind enough to send it to me because you can't really download it from anywhere. So now we want to test this basically using our you know, new 86100A and look at the eye diagrams that come out of this at say 10 gigabit per second. So we can see how nice, they, how nice they look. Now the only issue is I have to check to see if the trigger output of this uh, supports what I want to do. Otherwise, we're going to have to use one of the other channels to generate a jitter, uh, generate a, a trigger signal so that we can actually do jitter measurement. So we're going to go ahead and take a look. But let me zoom in here and talk a little bit about how this is actually put together. So as you can see, they've put some glue on top of this component to, I suppose, it's supposed to hide it, I guess, and what it is, but that really doesn't hide anything because you can just always take the glue off. And nowadays, 10 gigabit per second is not that tricky to build anyway. But you can see we have differential outputs, positive and negative, coming from this. And if you look carefully, you can see that on the analyzer side, they have actually put a tiny resistor here and connected it to ground. So this did have differential inputs too, which makes sense because all the ASICs are going to be differential, but they're only taking one of them out so that you can only have a single-ended analyzer and you can have a differential uh, port there, but they just haven't populated it, which is unfortunate. I guess in theory, you could remove that and uh, then put in your own connector if you really wanted to have differential operation. But you can see this board supports optical modules here. And if you buy it with the optical module option, you can put that one in there. But this one, of course, doesn't have that, which I prefer anyway, because we want the electrical interface. Other than that, nothing's unusual going on. It does have a trigger signal. I haven't looked at the trigger signal, so it might be worthwhile to figure out what it is. But I'm eager to turn it on and connect it to our oscilloscope and see what we get. Okay, and here's our setup. I have connected this instrument directly now to our sampling module, and you can see at the bottom I'm running the software on that computer because it runs Windows XP, and that's what I need. And if you look carefully, you can see that we have a loopback, and therefore we have no errors. It'd be BER right now is zero on this channel because I have a perfect loopback. There you go, you can see BER is zero over here. So indeed it is working very well, and this is true for all the four channels, so the instrument is indeed working. Now the question is, how does the eye look? Well, if you want to find out how the eye diagram looks, we have to, of course, look at it on this instrument. Now, I'm sorry about the glare. There's not much I can do about it. I'm going to see if I can cover it, but uh, let's see how the eye looks. So the signal here is at 10 gigabit per second, and wow, look at that. That's a pretty nice looking eye. Now remember, this is going through a cable, and that cable is fairly good, so I expect it to have good bandwidth. We can go back into eye mask mode. And we can see what kind of jitter we have. And we can go ahead and measure a couple of parameters. We can measure the jitter RMS, of course. And we can measure the data rate. Let me see. Do we have the data rate anywhere here? Uh, rise time, fall time, eye width. There it is, bit rate. 
and check it out it's exactly 10 gigabit per second so it is correct and the jitter is 1.22 picosecond rms so that's basically close to what the instrument is capable of reporting so it is very very good and that's what is expected again this is only 10 gigabit per second and this is a measurement instrument so its eye diagram coming out is supposed to be very good that instru instrument does allow you to change the eye height so i can make the eye diagram uh, my eye height much much more smaller so here is a 100 millivolt and clear that you can see that indeed the eye is quite a bit smaller and we can see if the quality of the eye changes as a result of that you can see some double edging happening now yeah the indeed there is some differences in the bandwidth of the output driver of this unit at different bandwidths you can see that we have some double edging happening here and here and the jitter has gotten worse about 1.45 picosecond now the sensitivity of the unit is also going to be a little bit worse because we're at 10 millivolt per division but as you can see this is the reason why this instrument is so useful because of its correlated um, jitter and input signal and allows you to remove the jitter from the clock and therefore you get really the raw performance of the eye diagram itself so if the eye moves back and forth with respect to the trigger signal you would see that and that's what you're looking for so now if this follows into a cdr a, uh, a clock and data recovery system and it has a certain eye height and eye jitter and eye opening and all that that can be used look how nice there opening is here this shows quite a lot more bandwidth available from the system than what is being measured so i think that's pretty awesome now we have a few different things we can do future experiments with i'm pretty happy with this configuration of devices that we have here so leave in the comment section any ideas or any other things you want me to test i'm going to look for another module to put in here maybe a tdr module then we can do some tdr measurements as well but yeah it's pretty exciting and again this is all possible thanks to my patreon supporters this is the reason why we can put all these experiments together otherwise it'd be impossible so i'm really grateful for that so i'll see you in the comment section